CICD using Azure DevOps services. Uh, my name is Dane and Hudson. I'll be your presenter today. A little bit about me. Uh, that's my name, first bullet, Dane and Hudson. Uh, built my first website in 1998 using dynamic HTML. I don't know, did anybody use dynamic HTML when it first came out? No, nobody? Oh, man. Oh, one. We got one. We got one. Yes. OK. So it was really badass. You could have like changing banners at the top of your website, and you could have like a tail that would follow your mouse everywhere it went on the screen, uh, rounded buttons. I mean, it was, it was some legit stuff, right? So just so you guys know uh, what you're in for, that's the kind of stuff I deliver, all right? <laughs> Uh, UNF graduate from, in 2006, computer science was my major, uh, which is like uh, the hardware side, I guess you would say, right? You get to build chips and shit, you know, you understand how registers work and all that stuff. Uh, computer information systems minor, which is more of like the programming side, you know, you write the websites, you do all that kind of stuff, all that jazz. I am a Microsoft certified professional. I uh, went ahead and took those tests and passed them and they gave me a certificate for that. Um, first job out of college was at CSX Technology. Does anybody work CSX Technology? No, no takers? Okay, yep, so tracking trains. Tracking trains on the track. You know, I know you guys probably think there's not much to do, right? There's a track, they don't really go anywhere else. Uh, but we were tracking them uh, using uh, JCL and COBOL, right, on Big Iron. Who knows what Big Iron is, right? The IBM mainframe. Ugh. Okay, no takers. C, right, we were tracking with satellite. We were using C uh, to the, read the messages off the satellite. Um, after that, I joined Beeline. Any Beeliners? Beeliners, hey -o. There you are. All right, cool. Yeah, do they still have the Beeline persistent settings editor thing for doing the data layer? God, I fucking hated that thing. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's a thing. Yeah, so after Beeline, you know, Beeline was pretty much, hey, .NET, and I was like, man, this is awesome. So I stuck with .NET you know, for the rest of my career, right? I'm still doing .NET to this day. I've been architecting and managing teams for about 10 years now to varying degrees of success, right, depending on who you talk to. Uh, my uh, passion has always been writing code and designing solutions, right? I've been in the management positions where it was like literally meetings nine to five. I hated that. so. Took a step back from managing teams, and now I'm like just crushing it uh, with uh, .NET Core uh, running on Azure, right? And uh, the final bullet point is very important. My meme game is super strong, right? So be prepared. Here's the first one, right? All right. At this point, I'm too afraid to ask, right? So hopefully you guys have a clue. Maybe you don't. But if you don't, don't worry about it. You don't have to ask because I'm going to tell you all about it. It's going to be great. All right. So what are we going to talk about today? Some of the things we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about versioning, right? You need to version your artifacts or software. We're going to talk about Docker. We're going to talk about continuous integration. We're going to talk about continuous deployment and continuous delivery, right? CD, right? Could be both of those things, one of those things. Um, continuous testing, right? That's something new that doesn't get included in the acronym for whatever reason, but it's actually like a big part of it. Um, we're, going to, we're going to talk about Azure DevOps services. So we're going to be using the tools in Azure DevOps services to uh, pretty much run our entire software development team, right? It, it'll pretty much do everything. You don't need to, uh, you know, go out and get a Bitbucket or you don't need to go out and get all these other things, right? Uh, you can actually do everything you need through DevOps. You don't have to, right? It'll work with other ones. Uh, but if you wanted to, you could keep it all in-house with uh, just one solution. And then we're going to talk about Ab uh, Azure Kubernetes services. Do I have anybody, any British people in? In, in the audience? No? No British? Okay. Well, if you guys have ever heard a British person say Kubernetes, it is life-changing, right? I was really hoping that you guys might be able to experience that, uh, but you're just going to have to go with the English pronunciation, which is Kubernetes, right? Uh, or K8, right? Because uh, there's eight characters in between the K and the... Okay. Uh, tore through a simple application. Uh, we're going to talk about pipeline and the Azure... K8S cluster, right? Kubernetes cluster, right? So that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is version our software, right? Version our artifact that's going to be going through our pipeline, right? And so you guys might have heard of semantic versioning. Anybody? Semantic versioning? Hands? Yeah, a couple people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo! 
All right, so there's a website, uh, semver.org, right? You guys can go and check that out uh, if you want to read, I don't know, 10, 12 pages about how to version software. It kind of just boils down into a major, minor patch, and then you might have like an additional label at the end, right? Like dash alpha, dash beta, you know, dash release, right? Something like that. But your major is always going to be like, you tick that up. When you make incompatible API changes, your minor is going to be like for minor, minor stuff you add. And then the patch, right, in our scenario, is just going to be the build number, right? So every time we put out a new piece of software, every time we build our artifact, we're just going to be a new patch version, right? So you'll see that we actually use a format that's very similar to that first example, 1.9.2345, where 1 is the major, 9 is the minor, and uh, patch is that last little bit right there. OK? Cool. Second meme, all right? What if I told you you can run a computer inside your computer, right? And so what am I talking about there? I'm talking about Docker, right? Uh, Docker provides the ability for you to package and run your application, right? Uh, you know, you have the Docker daemon, which is basically the thing that runs everything. And you have the Docker client, which is how you interact with Docker. Uh, it uses a thing called registries to put your Docker images up there so that you can grab them, right? So what we're going to be using registries for is to we will put our image out there in the registry, and then our Kubernetes cluster will go and get that image and then start it and run it, right? Uh, and it'll run it inside of a container, right? Uh, so it'll take that image and it'll run it inside of a container, right? And so uh, you have tools like Docker or Desktop that you can run on your like Mac or your Windows if you run to run Docker locally. You know, you can actually run Docker inside of Docker, right? If you really wanted to do that, um, you know, that's a thing that you could do. Nobody's going to stop you. Uh, continuous integration, right? Uh, the CI in CI CD. Uh, the practice of merging all software developers' working copies into a main line several times a day. Question How many people use Git? Are you guys using Git? Okay. How many people use Subversion? How many people use Mercurial? What about TFS? Oh, there's a TFS way back there, yes. Okay, cool. Yep, yep. So you're merging your software into your main line uh, multiple times a day, right? That's continuous integration. Uh, normally, in your, continu in, in your continuous integration step, you're going to compile the code, and you're going to run some tests. And most importantly, I don't think any continuous integration pipeline is really complete without Agnes, right? So Agnes will come and visit you if you broke the build, right? Do I know, does anybody know who Agnes is? No? Nobody knows who Agnes is. All right. This is Agnes, all right? She will come and visit you, right? She's none too pleased with you, bub. You broke the build, right? You should have known that you were making breaking changes, but you checked them in anyways, OK? So make sure when you guys are configuring your CI pipelines that you include a step to send an email with Agnes should the build fail, OK? That's very crucial, right? Absolutely crucial. OK. <clears throat> now let's talk about the CD of CICD, right? So of course, we're talking about continuous delivery and continuous deployment, right? Uh, so deployment and delivery are very similar, right? But the only difference between the two is that when you're running like a CD continuous delivery model, right, you're basically just creating an artifact, right? And it's up to somebody to push a button to deploy that artifact out to your environment, right? Whereas when you're running a continuous deployment model, it's automated, right? And what you'll find in most scenarios is that you actually mix and match the flavors a little bit. And obviously, you can't have the deployment part without the delivery part. But you'll find that, at least in my experience, we normally do continuous deployment to our lower environments. And then our upper environments, like you know, a UAT environment or a production environment, will be continuous delivery, where due to like SOX compliance or whatever issue, right, you'll need somebody to actually go in and validate that the build is good, all our QA tests pass, both automated and manual, and we can go ahead and promote this version to our production environment. OK. I don't always test my code, but when I do, I do it in production. All right, who's guilty of this? 
right? Okay, yeah, come on, yeah, yeah, we all are. Yep, yeah. uh-huh, yep. Yeah. So let's talk about continuous testing, right? This is the part of uh, the puzzle that gets left out of the acronym, right? There's, it's not like CI, CT is in with the CI, but then it's also CT is after the CD, right? It just would be an ugly acronym, right? Nobody wants to say that. Uh, so continuous testing uh, happens in your pipeline. Uh, it's the process of executing your automated tests, right, as part of the pipeline. And you get that feedback immediately, right? Unit tests. Who here writes unit tests? Anybody? Yes, unit tests. All right. Mm. Love it. OK. Uh, also, integration tests, functional tests. What's the difference between integration and functional tests? I don't know. I feel like they're the same thing. Some people say they're different. Uh, API tests. Is it a functional test? I don't know. That's a different thing, too. And then system tests, right? It could be any one of those flavors, right? Uh, it's like all gray in there for me. But uh, you know, some people like to break them out into uh, you know, the different flavors. And you can like, look those up on Wikipedia. They all have their own Wikipedia page. Uh, if you're interested to see what the differences are there, they're, they're minor. But you run those as part of your pipeline, both in the continuous integrations phase and probably in the continuous deployment phase as well. You probably want to run uh, both of those uh, things. So what is Azure DevOps, right? So Azure DevOps is broken down into these one, two, three, four, five things, five things. Right? Uh, you got your boards, right? which is going to be basically your planning, tickets, that kind of stuff. You have your repos, which is going to be your repositories. Right? So you're going to have your files, your commits, your pushes, branches, tags, pull requests. Uh, your pipelines, right? and there's going to be a couple different flavors of pipelines. Uh, you got your regulars like CI pipelines. You got environments right? where you can basically create like a development environment, QA, UAT production, and then put all your your resources into each bucket, should you want to. You don't have to, but you could. Uh, you, can you can create release pipelines, right, which is like the CD part of it. So the first part, pipelines CI, releases CD. right. Uh, you can create a library of tasks. You can create task groups and deployment groups. The deployment groups will be like advanced deployment scenarios where I need to deploy like seven APIs and two websites. right. You can create deployment groups to do that kind of stuff, should you need to do that. Uh, and then finally, your testing plans, like your manual testing plans, that kind of stuff. And artifacts, right? Uh, and not really artifacts in the sense of like images, like Docker images, but more like artifacts like uh, maybe NPM packages, that kind of stuff, right? So uh, you can NuGet packages, right? If you have your own NuGets, uh, you could do that. Which, who uses NuGet packages here, builds their own NuGet packages? OK, cool. What about submodules? Anybody use submodules? My man, right there. He knows what's up, right? I, want, I encourage all of you to look at Git submodules. If you're using Git, look at Git submodules and then throw away your NuGet packages, right? Because you'll definitely like the experience of using Git submodules over NuGet packages. In my personal opinion, they're better, right? Submodules, you can actually see the code. Uh, NuGet packages, you can't without like decompiling and shit. So um, <clears throat> you can still version it and all that other stuff, right? So, Pape it. That Kubernetes is so hot right now. Okay, who's using Kubernetes right now? One, two, three. Okay, yeah. So we got some Kubernetes users, right? So all the rest of you are here because you want to get in on that hotness. Uh, I don't blame you. It's pretty sweet. We've been running Kubernetes in production for like two years now in Azure, and I've cussed at it maybe a handful of times. So it's been great, honestly. I haven't. Uh, I don't have much complaints about it. So uh, finally, we're going to be talking about, I think this is finally. I don't know. I don't know how many slides I have. But uh, the next thing uh, that we'll talk about is Kubernetes services, right? So running Kubernetes inside of Azure, right? So it's a service that they provide, which basically stands up all the infrastructure that you need to run Kubernetes and gives you a nice little portal to manage most of the stuff that you would care about in Kubernetes. And those include things like namespaces, right? So namespaces is like grouping of applications, right? So if you have, for example, a giant cluster and you run multiple different products in it and maybe even multiple different environments, you can create namespaces for each one of those products or each one of those environments and run them all inside of one giant uh, Kubernetes cluster should you want to, right? Um, 
the workloads, right? So those are basically the tasks that are running, the cron jobs, the containers, all that stuff that are running inside Kubernetes. Uh, the services and the ingresses, right? So those would be the things coming into your Kubernetes cluster. Talk about storage, right? You can create like persistent volume claims to actually map an Azure storage device to your Kubernetes cluster so that a uh, container running on or a uh, container running on a pod can actually connect to that and store files there and read files out of it. Uh, we'll talk about app configuration, right? So who here is familiar with um, the 12-factor apps and the idea around uh, application configuration should come from the environment? Right, couple, one, two. So uh, we'll talk about uh, setting up a configuration service so that you can read configuration. Because if you think about it, you have your application that's running on a bunch of different pods, right? And they all need to get the application configuration. But let's say you need to change something, like you want to change the logging level, right? Well, you don't have to log into each pod and manually update the app settings.json file, right? And have it reload, right? So you just point them all at an app configuration service, and then it can pull all the configuration uh, from that guy. Voila. Uh, same thing with uh, feature management. Does anybody use feature flags? Feature flags are awesome, people. Yes. We love feature flags. And you can do them inside the app configuration service provided by Azure. It's a first class citizen. The code is super simple. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Talk about node pools, right? So those are the pools of your nodes, the nodes of the machines running Kubernetes. We'll talk about networking coming in, your, uh, how you're routing traffic into your uh, Kubernetes cluster, and how traffic kind of floats around inside of the cluster itself. I guess we could talk about some of that. Uh, we'll talk about auto scaling and limits, right? So horizontal pod auto scalers, right? So when you start bumping up against resource limits, you can start scaling out automatically on Kubernetes, right? So if you guys haven't created limits in a horizontal pod auto scaling file for your Kubernetes deployments, you're not doing it right, right? You're shooting yourself in your foot because then you're not going to scale correctly when you need to. And that's why you're using Kubernetes, so that you can scale when you need to, all right? Talk about a couple different, actually, we're only going to talk about one uh, type of deployment, which is manifest files, using manifest files to deploy. Uh, but you can also do something more advanced with like Helm charts, right? If you have multiple things that you want to deploy at the same time. Uh, we don't in our scenario. And then finally, we can talk about uh, secrets and identities, right? So secrets, does anybody use secrets in their application? Right, yep, those passwords you're not allowed to know, but really you do know, and they're copied in like your OneNote over here, and <laughs> no, but you don't tell anybody about them. Yep, but you copy them and you put them in the secrets file, and then you're good to go. So uh, yeah, we'll talk about secrets, loading those from Key Vault, right? So Azure has a service that it provides called Key Vault. Uh, but in order to connect to Key Vault, you have to configure a pod so it runs under a managed identity, right? Which is basically a user. Right? Uh, so you create a managed identity, and then you bind that managed identity to your pod when it starts up. And then all the calls that it makes out to uh, Key Vault will be under that managed identity and have those permissions to read secrets. I can talk about that some. Uh, what's next? Oh, yes. Has anybody done this before? Set up uh, an environment in Azure? OK, yeah. You guys are all very lucky. I mean, I had to do this, and it was not fun, but I managed to work through it. But I wanted to give you guys kind of like a high-level overview of what an environment setup might look like in Azure, um, not like your typical like demo where you just like create a resource group, and then there's a cluster in the resource group, and it kind of does you know, you know, the demo stuff, but it's not like a real-world setup, right? So <clears throat> this is a real world, real world setup, right? This is a setup very similar to, to, to what we're running. And in our, our company, uh, we have a Kubernetes cluster for every product for every environment, right? And so we have multiple, five products, right? And four environments, right? So we've got a number of clusters out there running. And the way Azure recommends, uh, Microsoft recommends that you set up you know, such an environment is they call it the hub and spoke network topology. Right? And so you have a hub, which is going to be your hub VNet, right? And then each spoke, right, whatever that might be, uh, development environment, you know, staging environment, UAT production environment, or maybe by product, right? Product one, dev, product two, dev, product three, or maybe all environments, however you set that up, is its own other VNet, right? 
And then you can connect these VNets uh, through a couple different mechanisms, right? You can use VNet peering, or maybe you create a connection between the two different VNets, which is what we did. Um, and then you set up your hub so that it has your application gateway, right? And so your application gateway is listening on your URL, like myapi.com, and it routes that traffic after it passes through the web application firewall, right? Because you guys are probably going to want uh, a WAF sitting out there to block all that malicious traffic. And then it'll route it to the correct uh, Kubernetes cluster for service, right? And so you'll set that up in your application gateway subnet in your hub VNet. Uh, you'll probably have D private DNS zones, right? So that your SQL server is only available through the VPN, right? Your Cosmos DB is only available through the VPN, right? Key Vault is only available through the VPN, so they have private endpoints uh, created on them. And then uh, your VPN would then, you would authenticate to your VPN to access those, those resources. And the other stuff is going to be running in your development environment, in this case, VNet, uh, where you have your Kubernetes cluster and all the other stuff, right? And it's important to note here, right, that you have enough IP address ranges for every single pod that you want to run in your cluster, right? And so you want to make sure that you make this subnet big enough to host everything you might want, right? So let's say, for example, I got three nodes. Uh, those three nodes host 30 pods. That's 90 IP addresses I need right there, right, right off the get. That's for a pretty small cluster, right? So you want to make sure that you make those uh, considerations while you're planning your network topology, should you need to do that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Demo time. What could possibly go wrong? I don't know. We'll find out. OK. Let's take a tour. I created a uh, repository called Code on the Beach 2022. That's us. Uh, and we'll run through uh, Azure DevOps right here, right? So <clears throat> this is the first part, boards, right? You got summary, dashboards, and a wiki, right? So you can create a wiki. Uh, wiki can either be code-based or it can be like hosted in the site and then you can edit it, kind of like a traditional wiki, or you can have it like committed to your code base and actually modify it that way. I don't use the wiki. It's not even set up, but. That's a thing that you could do, should you want to. Uh, the summary is just the uh, readme.markdown, right? That's in uh, the repository. And it's just like generic, you know, comes with the starter kit. But I did add this guy, right? So who here, who here does static code analysis? One guy, two guys, three, four, five. OK, we got a few. We got a few. All right. so. One thing I always like to talk about is the inner loop, right? The inner loop is what a developer's job is. Your job is the inner loop, right? Write code, build, <coughs> test. Write code, build, test. Write code, build, test. Write code, build, test, right? That's your inner loop. You want your inner loop to be as fast as possible. You don't want to have to wait forever to get feedback on your changes, right? And so one of the things that helps tremendously is Sonar Cloud, right? Or pretty much any static code analysis tool. In this case, I use Sonar Cloud. It's super easy. It integrates into your Azure repos. You'll see that here in a second. And it gives you static code analysis. And let's take a look at it. If I click it, what happens? Open a new tab. Oh, I need to log in. Log in with this guy. Cool. All right. All right. All right. All right. Water on my keypad. OK. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> so you'll see here uh, my static code analysis passed. It scanned all my codes. It did find one code smell that it doesn't like, right? So you can drill into it, and it'll tell you what the code smell is, uh, who did it, uh, all that kind of stuff, right? It doesn't like this. Remove this commented out code, right? I have some commented out code in there. Uh, it doesn't like it. It wants me to remove it. I, mean, I could potentially do that. But I wanted to show you guys some stuff, uh, so I'm not going to do that. Boom, we're back. OK, cool. Yeah, so uh, static code analysis, uh, it does it on branches, right? Uh, which we're, we'll take a look at in a second, and the main branch, all that jazz. So we'll take a look at that here in a second, right? So that's what that is, right? It integrates into our pipeline. We actually push, we run a static code analysis, and we push those results up inside of our pipeline, which is super cool. Um, what else? Uh, dashboards, right? So you can configure a dashboard. 
uh, should you be like a project manager or something like that? You want to see, you know, how your sprint's running, uh, you know, who's doing what, how your builds are doing, uh, what the velocity of your team is, the sprint burn down, blah, 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 your deployments, are they succeeding, right? <clears throat> so you can see all that stuff uh, on the dashboard should you want uh, to see that stuff. And it's really easy to set up. Like, literally, you just, like, click the button, and it's like, what repository? And then you click that repository, and it's like, okay, I've done it. And everybody's like, woohoo. All right, so get work items, boards, backlogs, sprints, queues, delivery plans. Um, how much time do I have? Eh. So you can manage your work items through here, right? You can create your sprints, uh, your backlogs, you can do boards, uh, you know. Is, there, is anybody not running Agile? Everybody's running Agile, okay, okay, cool, yep. So you guys are all familiar with this. I won't go into a whole lot of detail there. I think you guys understand how it works. Oh, question. How long, who's running a one week sprint? How, how about two weeks? Two weeks? How about three weeks? Wow, how about four weeks? Nobody. Wait, kind of. Are you Kanban? Kind of, okay. Hey, that's the great thing about Agile, right? I mean, it can be whatever. Like, you know, you get tickets like this, do a thing, right? That happens all the time. I don't know about you guys, but my favorite is when I get a ticket that's just the subject, right? There's no description. Like, there's literally a description place. You can put something in description, but that doesn't ever happen. I don't know why. I, I, just, I don't know. All right. Um, yeah. So the next one is the repos, right? So here you can see the source code. We'll take a look at the source code here in a bit, uh, kind of dig into it a little bit, uh, see what's going on there. Uh, you can see, obviously, the commits that are going into the repository. You can see uh, the pushes, right? Uh, who's pushing what? Uh, you can see the different branches, right? So we got uh, two branches. One of the cool things about the branches is that uh, you can actually see, like, uh, the static code analysis results, right? And the build status and all that stuff, right? So you can see all that cool stuff uh, inside of the branch, right? So yeah, I can see that in my, in my branch, right? So as I created this branch, you know, it ran the static code analysis, it came back with code coverage numbers and all that jazz, right? So I can see that uh, my, uh, my static code analysis failed. I got a B instead of an A, so that's not good. Uh, my code coverage, I think, was looking pretty decent. Yep, 100%. 100% on the code coverage, right? And you can dig into, you know, the details there and see exactly what lines are covered and all that jazz, right? So that's kind of cool. Uh, you can see that all my tests passed. None of them failed, right? And you can change this little guy, clear that out. Boom, right? There's all my tests that are running and passing. I scroll down through here, right? And see those, right? So. Uh, that's the part of the continuous integration pipeline that we care about as developers, right? When I create a feature branch, I'm not quite ready to create a pull request, but I still want to know, am I good? Like, would I pass the sniff test, right? And so our pipeline, whenever we create feature branches, goes ahead and it builds that code, it runs the static code analysis, it runs the unit test to make sure that should I create a pull request, uh, things will be uh, legit and I wouldn't run into any unforeseen issues. Uh, you can also do tags here, right? Who uses tags in the repository? And what do you guys use them for? Git flow. Git flow? Okay, so you're running Git flow. Anybody releases. else? Releases primarily. Yeah, releases, right? Very popular to tag a, tag a repository with a release moniker, right? Whatever that might be. You guys know you can actually do that directly in your pipeline, right? We do that uh, at my company, is we tag our uh, releases, right, with the version number. And then uh, finally, we can talk about uh, pull requests, right? So I've created my feature branch. I've done all my code. Uh, you know, I ignored the warning that said, hey, you got a B rating, and um, you know, things are not looking up to par. I said, I don't care. I'm going to create a pull request. So I created a pull request, right? And this is what that pull request looks like. I said, hey, I want to merge my demo branch into the main branch. Um, and the cool thing, the really cool thing about static code analysis is that it actually went ahead and created uh, like automatic, hey, you need to fix this kind of stuff, right? Where is that? 
<laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work items must be linked, succeeded. Yep, comments must be resolved, right? Quality gate failed, right? So I created this pull request. My build succeeded. I had a work item, right? That was one of the things I configured in my repository to actually make sure that pull request had to be linked up to a work item. Uh, but there are comments. But I, as a reviewer, didn't actually go in there and add any comments. What happened was the Sonar Cloud integration noticed the code smells and went ahead and added those comments automatically for me, right? So t think about that inner loop, right? Who here reviews code is like a code reviewer, right? So one of the things you guys probably freaking hate is the stupid mistakes that always seem to get in, right? Um, you know, you're human too. You make dumb mistakes, right? We all miss things, right? But the static code analysis never misses anything, right? And it'll go and it'll add those comments automatically for you to let you know that things aren't up to the sniff test, right? Which is super helpful in a really big pull request, right? Because, I mean, let's be honest. If it's really big, it's automatically getting approved, right? If you guys ever want to push something shady into production, just make that pull request huge, right? Going in. I guarantee it. Guarantee it's going in, right? You want there to be a million problems? One line of code. There's like seven spelling mistakes. You need to add a space right here. It's, you know, it's proven. It's a fact. It's a fact. OK, cool. So we can scroll down a little bit, and we can see the comments that were added automatically to my code review, right? I wanted to add this new endpoint that said goodbye uh, to the code on the beach 2022 attendees. Um, but it doesn't like that uh, because it thinks that that value should be a constant, right? Yeah, maybe, maybe not, right? Um, you know, same thing right here. Remove this, hello, code on the beach, 2022 attendees. Yep, make that, a, make that a constant as well, right? So pretty cool, right, um, that it automatically does that. And you don't have to do that. OK. All right, now let's talk about pipelines. Where am I at? 30 minutes to go. Pick up the pace. OK, so. Um, Pipelines, 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 pipelines. Right, OK, so here we go. Here are the pipelines. They're beautiful. They're green. Um, you know, I deleted all the ones that were red. There's probably like 700 that were red. And then I got these, these ones go green. And I'm like, yes, delete the other ones. And we're good. And so nobody knows that I ever was not, oh, there's one right there. It was, it was ever not successful. Oh, it's getting, it's getting embarrassing. OK, here we go. Let's go back up here. Always green. Always green. All right. <clears throat> Did anybody watch Silicon Valley? I mean, hilarious show. Golly, I love that show. All right, cool. So the first three uh, pipelines that we see that were run, uh, we have the top one, which was run for the pull request. So when I created the pull request, the pipeline ran. But it only ran two steps, right? And we don't care about the last two steps for pull requests, right? Uh, same thing with when we created our feature branch, which is row number two, right? That's just running our build and test. It doesn't care about the deployment stuff and all that other stuff because it's not going anywhere, right? But when we make changes to the main line, that's when we run all four, right? And so you'll see that all four get run there, right? So uh, let's go ahead and edit this pipeline so you guys can see uh, what it looks like, right? So you define your pipeline in uh, Azure Pipelines.yaml, right? You put that in your repository at the root of the repository and uh, you'll be good to go, right? And you'll notice the first step right here, trigger, right? So that's basically uh, when is your pipeline going to be automatically triggered, right? It's going to be triggered when there's a change to main, incoming change to main, right? Or when there's uh, a change to a feature branch, right? You could do hot fix. You could have a trigger for hot tick. You could trigger for release, right? If you do release branching strategy, right? You can have, you know, whatever you put there, it'll run it. You can use, uh, I think, skip CID or skip CI. Skip CI in your comment if you want to skip CI completely. Pro tip right there if you don't want to run it for whatever reason, right? Uh, let's say you're just like updating documentation. And for whatever reason, they haven't actually excluded the documentation folder from your pipeline, which you can do. Uh, you could skip it that way too. OK. So you'll notice right up here we got a couple variables. Uh, we got our container. Or, I'm sorry, our Docker registry service connection, right? Uh, our image repository, which is where we're going to be dropping our image, right? We created a uh, container registry for that, right? Which is a service that Azure provides. 
Uh, we got our Docker file. That's like where we go to look to build the Docker file. Uh, our version number, our defaults to 1.0 point, whatever our build ID is, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Whatever. Uh, our image name, right? So how we're building our, this is basically the build server, right? What, what is it going to be? It's going to be Ubuntu latest, right? It could be Windows. It could be any, any number of things, right? It's up to you guys, right? And you guys see you can, like, you can add these tasks right here on the side. There's so many tasks, so many tasks that you can add. And then you can go to the marketplace, and you can find even more tasks, and you can add those tasks, right? So your pipelines are super customizable, right? Um, but in our pipeline, we are going to first version our code, which is we're going to set the semantic version. And this is a cool little script I wrote uh, that basically parses the CS project file, and it looks for the version prefix and the version suffix node in your CS project file. Right? So if you're doing .NET development, uh, you, can do, uh, you can specify the version prefix and the version suffix in your CS project. And uh, I parse that out, grab that, append the build number, and then I set that version number. So you'll see the version number actually set, blah, blah, right there. Uh, the next thing we do is we want to analyze. Right? We want to analyze our project. Right? So I'm using Sonar Cloud right, to do my static code analysis. Right, so you can see right here where I'm prepping it. I'm passing in the project key and project name. Uh, and then we do the .NET stuff, right? Restoring our project, building our project, uh, installing uh, our .NET tools right, for restore. And then we're running our unit test where we specify a couple of configuration parameters right, in order to get that stuff, those test results, to show up nicely uh, in Azure DevOps where we collect coverage is true. Uh, output format is going to be Cobertura and uh, just basically specify our output directory for our coverage report. And then we create our report by doing this, run report generator. And you guys know you can do this on your own machine, right? So you don't even have to do uh, this in a pipeline, right? You can literally run these tools on your own machine if you want to ever see uh, what your code coverage percentage is. And then finally, we publish those results out uh, to the, the people that care about them, Azure DevOps and uh, Sonar Cloud. Cool. Uh, the next thing we do is build, right? But you'll notice here that we only build this guy if our analyze step succeeded, right? And uh, if our source branch is the main branch, right? Easy peasy. Lemon squeezy. Cool. All right. Here is a pro tip. Pro tip when versioning uh, your Docker image, right? So you know that uh, when you build a Docker container, you're at your Docker file, right? And you have your version, but that's in your CI CD pipeline. Well, how do I get my version from my CI CD pipeline into my Docker build, right? Because I need to get that, that value in there because I want to set the version uh, to that value when I'm building my .NET application inside of Docker. So that way, when I launch my .NET application, it'll say, oh, my version is this, right? Because it's built into the assembly, right? And so in order to do that, uh, you go ahead, and I go ahead and tag it uh, with the version, right? And then I go ahead and pass in that build arg version, right? And so you'll see in our Docker file, we actually have a version uh, argument that we pass in right there, and that gets set, right? So that's that. That's the pro tip. Yep, yep. Deploy our manifest, and then we deploy to our development environment uh, should everything else succeed, right? Where we basically create an image pull secret, deploy to Kubernetes, where it just basically goes out to Kubernetes, grabs it, and deploys it, right? And it deploys it based on the manifests that we have stored in our repository, right? And so that's that. Hey, where, where's Agnes? Agnes? Yeah. I, I didn't have time to get Agnes in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, cool. So that's our continuous integration pipeline. And then let's talk about like, our continuous deployment pipeline, right? So here is our, our, I'm sorry, continuous delivery pipeline. That one was deploying, right? It's going to dev environment. Every time that you make a change to the main line, it goes to the dev environment. And so then in our continuous delivery pipeline, uh, you set that up a little bit differently, right? It's not a YAML file. It's uh, like a user interface file, right? I guess technically you could use a YAML file, but why would you? Um, so in here, you specify your artifacts, right? And these are your build artifacts. They can come from anywhere. Uh, in our case, because I'm running integration tests, uh, I, I, I actually referenced the repo. You can see down there, underscore repo. That's actually the repository. Uh, 
And so I pull in my integration suite from there. And then uh, the code on the beach is actually the image that's stored in the container registry on Azure, right? And so you can use both of those as artifacts to any one of these guys, right? And so here's our deployment to production, where we basically set the version number, download the artifact, right? Create the image pull secret, and uh, deploy it to production, right, based on the manifest files, right? And so all this is pretty, pretty straightforward. You basically specify where your manifest files are. They're stored in your source code, and you go. And then I run uh, some Selenium tests, right? Who's using Selenium? A couple head nods, OK. Have you guys ever seen Selenium run? No? Is this it? Is this it? Is this it? This is it. I think this is it. Let me hit play. I'm going to run these tests. So you guys can see uh, Selenium in action, maybe, if I have internet. Hey. Cool. All right, so test one. Does it work? Test two. Yep, that works. OK, cool. Cool. Can I scroll down? Because you guys can't see the whole thing, right? It actually types in the box, All right? Yep, there you go. Yeah. OK, cool, right? So automation tests, right? Pretty cool, right? We run those as part of our pipeline, right, to make sure that the website is doing the things we want it to do. Um, yeah, OK, cool. And then finally, there's the test plans and all that stuff, but I won't talk about that, right? All righty. So one thing I did want to show you guys was the manifest file, right? So you guys can see what manifest files look like. So I have some up here, I think, right? So you have a deployment, which is basically going to be defining your deployment, right? So this will be, uh, you, guys, you guys can look at Kubernetes like they do everything through manifest files. You can look up deployments and services and identity, you know, and horizontal pod auto scaling and all kinds of stuff, right? But basically, the deployment tells Kubernetes what to do and how to run your application, right? And so you're basically creating a deployment you called My API. Uh, it has a service that is called My API, which you'll see right here is this guy right here, which is basically saying My API is running on port 80, right? And then it's saying I need to bind my identity guy. So this is how you bind in your identity guy. And uh, then you're saying, hey, you need to pull the image from here, right? So it's pulling the image from there. And then it's setting some limits, right? So this is the amount of CPU resources your pod is allowed to use, the amount of memory that your pod is allowed to use, and then setting some environment variables. Uh, should you need to set any environment variables, you can do that there. And because you're probably using a horizontal pod autoscaler, you are not going to want to set the replicas, which is how many pods am I running in my cluster, right? You set this if you're not using hor horizontal pod autoscaling, otherwise you get one. Um, you can set that to whatever you want, or you could be super awesome and use the horizontal pod autoscaler, which is just like that. Set the min and max replicas on that bad puppy. And there's a couple of different utilization percentages it can key off of. I think most popular usage is the CPU usage, right? So if your CPU ever goes above 75% of its limit, then it'll, then it'll scale out. And so we've seen this happen. We did some load tests in our staging environment, and we went from three pods to 63 pods in a matter of seconds, scaled up from three nodes to five nodes, right, and then back down, right? So seamless, right? Uh, you, we didn't have to do anything, right? It just went up, and then it came back down. Gradually. Gradually came back down. OK. Uh, I said I was going to show you guys the Docker file, so I'll show you guys that. Right, so there's our arg version right there. So that's how you pass arguments into your document file, or your, your Docker file, right? And then you have to reference that arg in every layer, right? So you build a Docker layer by layer, right? First layer, second layer, third layer, fourth layer, right? Uh, and then here's where we use it, right? We set that version parameter to the version that we passed into our Docker file when we build our application, OK? Cool, 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 cool. Man, I have so much to talk about. So much to talk about in so little time. All right, so let's go into Azure, right? Cool. And let's look at Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Oh, one other thing I wanted to show you guys. I'm going to bounce around a little bit. Uh, yeah, app configuration is set up just like this. 
right, where you can basically set up your key vault, right? And so there's libraries for this, right? You can Google Azure Key Vault, and it's literally, it'll show you this, right? Same thing with uh, app configuration, right? So reading that configuration for your application uh, from your uh, configuration service that you set up in Azure, and then, you know, telling it to use feature flags, right? And feature flags are really cool, right? You can inject feature manager into your controller and, you know, grab features that way. You can actually use attributes to decorate your APIs, right? And it'll automatically respond with a 404 should that feature be disabled, right? And so um, you have options, lots of options there for how you use um, that kind of stuff. The app configuration and the feature manager. Okay, cool. So here's my Kubernetes cluster. Um, yeah. What do you guys think is the cheapest you can run a cluster for in Azure, Kubernetes? Give me, give me some answers. What are you guys thinking? How many dollars a month? There's seven? Did I hear seven? Zero. zero. Oh, well, zero. Can you run it for zero? Oh. I, I mean, I thought you had like some, <laughs> kind of, some kind of insider information. I was like, hey, man, hook me up. So the cheapest I was able to find it for 30 bucks, right? We're running one node, right? In an itty bitty tiny machine, right? Uh, but it's working, right? Uh, we can see that our services are here, right? And you can see that I have deployed my dev and prod, right? And they are running on uh, certain IP addresses that I cannot see. There they are over here, all right? So open that guy in a new tab. And we will just hit swagger. Voila, right, and so there's our version, right? Because that was our last pipeline that run was uh, 33, right? So 1.0.33 was the last one that we deployed out. Uh, you can see that everything is working. Uh, we have our version number right there. The code knows what version it's running, right, which is important with your semantic versioning, right? Uh, all that jazz, right? And so I think maybe I should go back here and we can merge in that pull request maybe and then see it run. And then maybe we can take questions, should there be any? I mean, I feel like approve. Approve. Resolve. Resolve. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. And complete. Yep, squash commit. Who uses squash commit? Everybody should be using squash commit. All right. Cool. Oh, we got to click on pipelines. Let's click on pipelines. Yes, there it goes. It's running. All right, see that? It's running. We got our version stage, and then we're going to go to our analyze stage, then our build stage, then our deploy stage, and this is all going to work. It's going to be green. We're going to love it. It's going to be a great thing. We're going to take a look at our artifacts that get uh, created from this bad puppy. It's going to be amazing. I'm running out of things to say while, while this runs. So we'll just sit here and watch it go. I guess I can click on the version stage now so you guys can see, right? Set the semantic version, right? It parsed the build was 36, right? Uh, it parsed the CS project file. It found it? Yep, found it. Set the version prefix to 1.0, right? So now our version is 1.0.36, right? We set that bad puppy. Uh, we're currently running our code analysis stage, which uh, checks out uh, the code. It does the Sonar Cloud Prepare, restores the project. Yep, build, yep. Installing the .NET tools, running the unit tests. All right, let's run the unit tests. Mm, yeah, amazing. Yep, yep, publish the code results. Yep, publish the static code analysis. We love it. It's looking good. Beautiful. <laughs> we can take a look at our tests already because that step already passed, right? We can see that uh, all my tests passed, all four of them, all my unit tests. So we're happy with that. That's looking good. All right, we see our warnings, right? Uh, one artifact was created, right? So that was our code coverage report.
Cool. So that finished. So now we're on to the build step, right? And so obviously this guy got updated with a new report, probably with the same code smells that I had before. Yep. Three findings. All right, so the analyze stage is done. The build stage is going on. We're building the Docker container, right? We passed in the version. There it goes. It got passed in right there, right? So that's good. We're happy with it. Running it, publishing it, pushing the image to the container registry, right? So we have a container registry created out here in the Azure land. Here it is right here. Right? And so every time that we build and push an image, it gets sent up right here to our container registry. And we can see all our different versions of the application sitting in our container registry. Right? Pretty neat. So it pushed it, it built it. Oh, so now we're going to go to the deployment stage, which will deploy it to the development environment. So what build number was that? 36, 36, right? So after this deployment stage finishes, we should be able to browse to the dev site and see it on 36. Let me go back home here. And go over here. All right, so this is an ingress. Yes, yes. All right, so I got two. I got the dev and the prod. They're both running on the same cluster. So this is dev, swagger. So there it is. It's already deployed, right? 36. Yeah, deployment stage completed. Yep. So there we go. So there's 36 in dev. Um, here is 33 in prod. Now we can go take a look at our release. And we'll see right here, we got 36 pending, right? We got to run that bad puppy, right? We got to deploy it to production. So we will approve it. Everything looks good. QA tested it, right, QA? No, you guys didn't test shit. <laughs> We're improving it. Oh, yeah. Cool. So it's going to queue that up. It's going to wait for uh, a machine to uh, run it, right? You got a couple options here for machines. Uh, you can use the Azure provided machines, or you can use your own machines, right? Uh, and you can run those machines uh, you know, in Azure. And you might want to do that if you make your Kubernetes cluster API plane <laughs> private, right? So if your API plane is private, uh, you can then, in order to deploy to it, you have to access it from a machine inside of like that virtual network, right? And so uh, you, know, you would use a private builder, uh, a build machine, instead of uh, the ones provided by Azure, right? So it created the image secret. Uh, it downloaded the manifests. It's going to deploy those manifests out to the Kubernetes cluster, uh, which is then going to uh, download those manifest or download that container or images from the container registry and uh, run the application, right? So we can see that uh, the deployment succeeded. So now production should be at 36.2. Yep, yep, 1.0.36. Production's looking good. We got a good buy in point, right? hey -o. right? Try that out. Hit the execute button. Oh, yeah, yeah, good buy. Yeah, nice, nice. And then uh, what else? We'll go back here. Oh, we're running our integration test now, right? So. MS test, download all the Selenium packages, right? Couple tasks here, and you're good to go. Uh, that'll run your Selenium test for you. Actually runs it in a, um, a full head version, right? You can take screenshots. Uh, you can take videos of your tests, uh, the whole nine yards, right? So we'll just validate that the uh, you know, deployment looks good. All of our automated integration tests, functional tests, API tests, I don't know, whatever you want to call them are passing, right? And uh, yeah, that'll be, that'll be it. That'll be all she wrote. If you guys want to take a look at what that looks like, let me go to the releases and then edit. And then you can take a look at this right here, right? So Visual Studio Test Platform Installer, right? That'll install all the tools that you need to run MS Test. That'll build, this will build, so, I'm pulling in the repository and building it myself. You might not have to do that, right? You might do that through, you know, you might have your automation test in a different repo that gets built and, you know, put somewhere, whatever, right? But I'm just doing it here. And then running the Selenium test, right? So pointing the test to the automation DLL, uh, and which is what I called my file, and you're good to go. 
And we should come back here and the release should be done. Maybe. Still running. Cool. Uh, any questions? Because that, that about wraps it up. Any questions? Concerns, comments. Do I do the slide thing? Yes. You cannot run the pipeline locally. Oh, what a pain in the ass, too. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Cool. How do I play this? Cool, cool, cool. So there it is. It's running the test right now. And you'll be able to see the test results uh, once that finishes. And I think these take about 30 seconds because there's a one second wait. Cool. No more questions? All right. So if you guys need this stuff, right, I know it's a lot to cover in like one hour. I can send you guys pipeline files, send you guys presentation, whatever you guys want, uh, get you started, uh, you know, running CI CD through Azure DevOps services. So there it goes, 100% pass rate, right? Click on that and you'll see all three of my tests pass and we can see that, you know, the Swagger UI came up, Git Hello worked and Git Echo worked, right? That's it.